Welcome and thank you for joining today's ONAP team meeting. Before we get started, please make sure you've opened your chat panel by clicking the chat bubble icon at the bottom right corner of your screen. If you need technical assistance throughout today's conference, you can please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the call over to Iris Friday. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Silas. Welcome, everyone. I'm Iris Friday. I'm a Native American Program Specialist in the Office of Performance and Planning, and I'll be serving as your MC for today's Team ONAP meeting. I want to thank you all for joining us. I know you have busy schedules, and we appreciate you tuning in today. We're going to get started by doing a roll call, and I want to start by um, calling out Alaska ONAP. Alaska ONAP, are you on the line? Yes, ma'am. All right. Greg Stuckey. Northwest ONAP, are you on the line? We are here, except for Tom. Thank you. Northern Plains ONAP, are you on the line? Do we have anyone from Northern Plains ONAP on the line? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, Gary Cooper. Um, is he on the speaker line? Can we advance him to the speaker line, please? Absolutely. We're also getting chat messages from Andy Conception, Polly Serrano, Elizabeth Altazan, Randall Nelson, and Deborah Richards, Terry Showalter, and Louisa Bonilla, that Northern is on the line. Great. Thank you so much, Northern Plains. All right, Southern Plains own app. Here. Yay. Glad you hear David. Eastern Woodlands own app, Neil Weichel. All right. They'll be joining shortly. Southwest ONAP, I believe they are in training today. Do we have anyone from Southwest ONAP? You can put it in the chat. And Hawaii, do we have Hawaii on the line? Okay, lots of thumbs up. All right, thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Here is our agenda for today's session. We are going to get an update from Gary Cooper on the HUD headquarters update, and then we'll hear from Jad Atala on a congressional update. For tribal consultation, we'll hear from Neil Minish and Damon Adams. For climate change and resilience funding, we will hear from Danielle Shope. And then we are going to get a GEMS demonstration from Thorne. And then I will do a short presentation on how to sign up for the ONAP listserv, and then we'll get into staff profiles. We will have new staff introductions, so the administrators or the headquarter directors will introduce new staff. And then we will have existing staff who will do their own introductions, and you are welcome to come on video. Uh, you will have that off from the event producer. So those are the housekeeping items, and we're going to go ahead and get started now. I'm going to turn it over to Gary Cooper. Gary, go ahead and get us started. Very well. Yeah. Hi, uh, Iris, can you hear me? We've been having some technical difficulties. Can, can you I can hear you. Well, I am here in. Uh, Maybe just a little bit louder, Gary. Come on now. Yeah, keep talking. So how about now, Iris? Oh, that is much better. Thank you so much. Oh, so apparently, like, this is the meeting place to be. The conference center is down at the REAC Center, just down the street from our ONAP headquarters office. And I'm here with our entire team from um, Southwest. Um, they are in town um, uh, this week doing uh, some training. 
And so it's an opportunity to bring the whole team from the Southwest together and to also give them a chance to um, um, come come visit us, not that wants to, but, but come see a, a DC. So we're glad to have them here. I wanted to uh, do my remarks uh, to you all from uh, with, with them here. So um, they're going to um, have some training that goes on all afternoon, but we're recording this session uh, so they can uh, have access to it and watch it at their, their leisure. I know we have a busy and packed agenda this afternoon um, and that there is a lot of stuff um, that folks have asked for that we wanna be sure to cover. Um, Heidi is um, um, out this week um, doing, taking some much deserved um, vacation time, um, which I hope our staff does as well. It's summertime, it's time to you know, take some personal time to refresh and and regroup and uh, recharge. Um, so if you haven't done that, you might consider doing that. And I'd encourage you to, to, to do that. Um, and with that, um, I think that I will just go ahead and turn it back over to Iris and the team to try to get through a very, very, very full and packed agenda because folks had asked for stuff. We didn't want to leave anything off that someone had asked for. So we um, uh, a lot of stuff to cover and probably some updates that just came in this week that we will get to. So I'll turn it back over to Iris and the entire team to uh, take us through the rest of it and, and say hello to um, the whole Southwest team and Southwest to everyone else at um, the, the rest of the team. Over. Woo! All right, thank you, Gary. Hi, uh, Southwest. No, no, no. Space, does Rehab Henry is pretty swanky. Okay, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Swone App, for showing up. I'm going to turn it over now to Jada Tala, who will provide us with a legislative update. Hey, everybody, how's it going? It's nice to see everybody. Um, uh, it's good to get together with everybody. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Um, Usually, so my name is Jada Tom, I'm the director of performance and planning in ONAP. Usually, people like to have a little update on where things stand in terms of congressional and legislative issues. So I'll go ahead and spend the next five minutes or so giving you all a little update to get get the lay of the land and figure out where we are. Um, I was planning on talking about something yesterday, and my plans changed when the House uh, Appropriations Committee released their fiscal year twenty four. HUD funding bill, uh, so I'll talk about that instead. Um, so as you all know, and some of you are new, so just to give you an idea, the way the process works for us to get our funding every year is the House um, Appropriations Committee and eventually the full House pass a bill funding HUD, and then the Senate does the same, and then they conference together, they negotiate a lot, and they eventually hopefully cut a deal and give us a full year Appropriations Act that they enact. Once they do that, we have funding that we can provide for our programs. That's when we run the Indian Housing Block Grant formula and allocate funding to tribes. That's when we have money for our competitive programs, IHBG Competitive and ICDBG. That's when we have authority to do loan guarantees and so forth and so on. So where we are in the process, um, we have funding through the end of um, September, through the end of the fiscal year, we'll probably be under a continuing resolution a CR after September, that's expected. But uh, there are some movement in terms of uh, bills that have been released for fiscal year 24 to give us an idea of where Congress is heading. Um, there's a good, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news generally is for HUD, the House fiscal year 24 bill was released and there are some pretty big cuts for HUD as a department. Um, pretty steep cuts that will probably not get enacted eventually, but you you get a sense of um, the funding levels that the house is proposing. The good news for us is tribal tribal housing uh, got some pretty big increases, record increases, um, because tribal housing is is a priority right now in the house. So the bill was released uh, yesterday or the day before. I quickly ran through it and was very excited to see the numbers in the bill. Um, the Indian Housing Block Grant Formula Program, our flagship program, normally gets funded at $787 million. The House is proposing to fund the program at over $1.1 billion. 
It's a $323 million increase. Big, big numbers. Good news for Indian country. The Senate has yet to release their bill, so we'll see where the Senate lands. But I think it's probably fair to say that we expect uh, an increase in funding this year, which is not always the case after 25 years of flat funding for these important programs. And I'm hoping for a big increase this year, but we have to see where things land. The other HUD programs uh, in the House bill are funded at about enacted levels. Um, Indian Housing Block Grant Competitive is at 150 million. ICDBG is at 75 million. Native Hawaiian program is at 23.22.3 million dollars. Our loan guarantee programs are fully funded to meet all program demand, and we got a couple of legislative proposals that we put forward. Uh, in, in the bill, including a proposal to expand the section 184 program to the whole country. Um, anyway, we'll keep you all posted. Uh, I would expect to be under a CR this year for a little while, but hopefully Congress gets its act together. Um, and we end up with some good numbers and if we get good numbers, then I think, um, that's 1 of the most important things we can do is get the assistance out to where it's needed. Cause you all know. Very well about the housing needs in Indian country. Um, that's my big legislative update. The only, uh, item I want to add, which is what I wanted to cover initially before this thing got released yesterday was you guys may have heard of something called the fiscal responsibility act or a couple of months ago when there was a lot of talk about the debt ceiling and concerns about Congress, not raising the debt ceiling and the U S going into default. Uh, well, Congress raised the debt ceiling and they cut it. They, they enacted a law called the fiscal responsibility act. And um, this is a law that kind of caps or figures out how much the government is going to fund itself uh, for the next two years, just as a, as a government as a whole. There was a couple of rescissions in there. Rescissions are provisions where Congress claws back money and takes back money uh, that is unspent and unobligated. Um, I just want to let you all know that that is money that is not taken away from any particular tribe. That is a little bit of. CARES Act funding that we never were able to effectively award because uh, tribes, small tribes mainly, uh, didn't take their, didn't accept their money, and uh, there wasn't an efficient way for us to award the money. So we had to give back 3.4 million dollars out of the over billion in CARES and ARP funding that we got for COVID relief. Um, if you all get any questions from your grantees about it, their money was not taken away. It's this money that we didn't award that was just sitting there that we didn't have an effective way to obligate. So in case you get questions, just know uh, it's $3.4 million. It's all uh, CARES money, IHBG CARES and ICDBG CARES money, and it's money that was not uh, previously ob obligated to tribes. That is my legislative update. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to put them in the chat or shoot me an email or call me. I'm going to turn it over next to Neil Minish on my staff and Damon Adams to talk to you about tribal consultation. Nice to see everybody. Thanks, Jad. Let me get my video going. All right, there we go. Uh, yeah, so good to see so many of you. It's been a while. I've actually been on detail for the last few months, so it's great to join this call. And I'm excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, tribal consultation. So, uh, as you may be aware, the United States has a unique relationship with sovereign tribal governments, which is built on a number of treaties, laws, and executive orders. The federal government is required to honor uh, our treaties and trust responsibilities to the programs we administer, but also we're required to uh, proactively work with tribes to uh, engage them in the policy making process, and that's through tribal consultation. Uh, each federal agency is required to maintain and enforce uh, tribal consultation policy, and HUD is no different. Um, if you're new to tribal programs, you may be asking, what is tribal consultation? Um, in the chat, I'm going to post uh, links to our tribal consultation policy page. Uh, there you'll find uh, the policy itself, definitions, uh, and some ongoing and current uh, artifacts and documents related to our travel consultation policy and uh, consultations that we've done. Um, but in short, let me say travel consultation is the direct and interactive involvement of tribes in the development of uh, regulatory policies or matters that have tribal implications. Um, so let me scroll down here. I'll get those links ready for you in one second. Um, you may wonder what triggers travel consultation. 
Um, so in, in our policy, we, we sort of have this captured as any uh, policy or program change that could have a substantial or direct impact on tribal governments. Uh, HUD's tribal consultation was developed and guided by the fundamental principles set forth in Executive Order 13175. And we are coming on the 30th anniversary of sort of the, the modern um, uh, tribal consultation policy directives put forth by the White House during the Clinton administration in 1994 that sort of helped to guide and direct what tribal consultation looks like today. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so when you're looking at the policy, I want you to uh, kind of focus on a few takeaways. Um, one, uh, if you are going to conduct tribal consultation, I would advise you to please reach out to our office, the Office of Performance and Planning. Some may say the best office in ONAP. I hear that's true. I'll leave it up to you to decide. Um, and we can walk you through the process and provide a little guidance uh, about tribal consultation. Uh, please uh, look at section C and D. Um, section C lays out the time requirements. Specifically, uh, it says that if you're going to if you're working on drafting new policy, you have to allot a 30 day comment period. Uh, however, in section D, it says, if you have already drafted the policy and you wanna seek comment on an existing policy, you have to provide a 60 day comment period. Um, I also wanna say another important area to note is that uh, HUD has sort of levels of consultation. One is sort of the traditional consultation we do, where we send out a letter notifying uh, tribes, what the issue area is, what we're seeking consultation on, providing the timeline, and we receive the comments, we review them, and then we make changes based upon the input that is received. Uh, the more formal version of that would be negotiated rulemaking, uh, which is sort of a consensus-based process that's triggered through uh, when the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act, or NAHASDA, uh, is reauthorized, uh, and that is the sort of more formal version of uh, of travel consultation. I do want to add that in addition to travel consultation, um, the White House over the last few years during this current administration has issued a few memoranda that have um, required federal agencies to further strengthen our nation to nation relationships with tribes. Um, the first of which that I'll mention is the, uh, the one that came out in 2021 on strengthening nation to nation relationships. I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, but part of that directive uh, required all federal agencies to create a tribal consultation plan of actions, which we did. Um, and as a part of that, we stated that we would work to create um, an intergovernmental advisory committee, which we launched in 2022. Um, and so you may have read about the TIAC. Um, that is part of, uh, in response to the directive that we received at the White House in 2021. Um, and we report on our accomplishments as it relates to travel consultation because of that directive or because of that uh, memorandum every year um, in September. Uh, I also want to say that in November of 2022, uh, around the time of the Tribal Nations Summit, uh, the White House issued a new MOU uh, on travel consultation to create uniform standards across the federal government. Many of these align with our current tribal consultation policy, However, there are some new uh, details and requirements uh, that I'll mention here. One was that we had to create formally a point of contact for HUD. And so our tribal consultation point of contact is ONAF's Deputy Assistant Secretary. Uh, additionally, we had to, um, we had to comply with a new requirement that after you've conducted the tribal consultation, you have to write a summary of all the feedback that has been uh, collected, and you have to um, share input on what was not uh, used in the development of policy and why it was not used. And so that is something we are still working on. Again, this is somewhat new, it was issued in November, but that is a big change that we are working to implement currently. Uh, and you can find more about that in the link that I'll publish in the chat. Um, I should say one other part of that MOU, which I think is going to be really helpful for us, is uh, the MOU requires OPM to develop government-wide tribal consultation training um, that they're working on now and will be rolled out, I, I hope, in the next uh, few years. 
uh, across the federal government. Um, so what does this mean for you? There's a lot of information here about travel consultation, a lot of links I'm gonna put in the chat. Uh, I guess the big takeaway again is if you, if you or your office are gonna conduct tribal consultation or you think you may need to, please reach out to me or our team in OPP. Uh, we'll be happy to walk you through the process and address any of your questions. Um, yeah, and, and, but to learn more about tribal consultation and what's going on with an active tribal consultation, I wanna turn things over to my colleague in the Office of Grants Management, Damon Adams. Damon, the floor is yours. And I am going to share my screen again. I had it loaded previously, but it somehow went down. Let me see if I can. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. No, it's not working. Okay. Damon, we do see your screen. We see the Indian Community Development Block grant slide up. Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Damon Adams, a grant management specialist in ONAP. I will briefly go over the Indian Community Development Block grant and explain some of the tribal consultation we are currently involved in. Uh, the purpose of the ICDBG grant is the development of viable Indian and Alaska Native communities with a focus on persons with low and moderate incomes. The two grant types are awarded are single purpose and imminent threat uh, or IT grants. The single purpose grants are competitive and for many different community development purposes, the, in, the imminent threat grants is awarded on a first come first serve basis and will be discussed further in subsequent slides. A little over 95 million was made available for the two, uh, 2022 ICDBG grant. Uh, 143 applications were received and 55 awards were made. The maximum award amount was 5 million and the minimum was 500,000. $75 million, as was mentioned earlier, was made available for the 2023 ICDBG grant. The minimum and maximum amounts remain the same, and we expect to make approximately 80 awards. Is it small? Can you, well, I guess everybody can see that. Okay, the imminent threat grant is intended to alleviate or remove imminent threats towards health and safety. The threats to be addressed must be such that an emergency exists or would exist if the threat was not addressed. The maximum amount for the award is 450,000 and 900,000 in presidentially declared areas. Sorry, I should have put that in. The funding available for the IT grant is 5 million and currently we have a balance of a little over 2 million. Okay, travel consultation. The authorized statute for the ICDBG grant is 24 CFR Part 1003. We are currently in the process of providing recommended updates to the statute. The statute was previously updated on July 31st, 1996. Drafting has begun with a small working group and based on feedback gathered from the area ONAP offices, we will incorporate feedback from ongoing tribal consultation. We will be working closely with the area ONAP POCs as the drafting takes place. Uh, and working on these revisions, we hope to alleviate issues relating to the ICDBG grant and the tribal community, improve the grant making process, update antiquated regulations, and receive on the ground feedback from the tribal community. A Dear Tribal letter was published on June 29th requesting feedback by August 2028. Some of our next steps uh, in accomplishing this task is to schedule in-person consultations and to schedule a national webinar consultation. As we go through the process of rewriting 
the statue, all are welcome to join our ICDBG office hours for any feedback you may have. And that concludes my part of this presentation. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Damon. We appreciate the presentation and the update. And thank you, Jad, for the good news on the Indian Housing Block Grant. Um, it's very good news to hear. So right now I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter, who is Danielle Shope. And Danielle will be doing a presentation on climate resilience, energy efficiency, and renewables. And Danielle, if you'd like, I can advance the slides for you. Thank you. Can you hear me, Paul Bright? Can hear you. Yeah, you sound good. <laughs> Great. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry. I'm having technical difficulties. I put on a blouse and nice earrings and everything. Um, but I didn't want my technical difficulties to get in the way. Okay, so I wanted to just, there's so much funding and I'm sure you've seen a lot of announcements about more funding opportunities around climate change, resilience and renewable energies. So I just wanted to share some of the funding sources, give you a sense of the scale and uh, hone in on some of the ones that I think that our grantees and TBHEs will want to take advantage of. So uh, next slide, please, for where to find funding. Okay, so, and these, this has links and we can make the PowerPoint available to you. Um, but there's two main sources of where to find all of this available funding in one place. One is the White House bipartisan Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Tribal Playbook. It's often referred to as BELS funding. Um, so this is $13 billion of programs and sources of funds. Not all of them are climate, um, but there's definitely some climate ones that we'll talk about in energy. And there's more than 150 programs. Following that, the Inflation Reduction Act came along, and this does have more of a climate focus. And there is a guidebook for the Inflation Reduction Act energy and investments in Indian country. And it identifies programs and sources specifically allocated for tribal communities. And there is more than $720 million in tribal specific programs or set asides. The third link on this is for University of Oregon's Tribal Climate Change Funding Guide. And it's just a really great website, and I'll go into it just a little bit more, but it is the place where tribes can find funding, both federal and non-federal, and national funding sources. And they can put in the keyword. And so that is the place out of all the hubs and navigators that I've seen, it seems the most comprehensive and is kept up to date. So next slide. So this is just pulling out from the, from the bill funding, some of the programs that are um, touch on climate and energy from relocation, 130 million to adaptation planning, DOE, there's tons of money going to DOE for, for tribes and others, including the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, which is a formula-based program with 11 million exclusively for tribal applicants. Um, there's also a variety of grid programs for, um, from USDA, USDA to DOE, and this is just one from the DOE. Um, and also tribes are available as an eligible, eligible entity for that. Um, next slide. Um, the IRA funding has, again, it's a little bit more targeted in climate. There was much more to kind of pull out. So this one I'll talk in more detail, so I'm not gonna talk about now, but there is a high efficiency electric home rebate program with 225 million that is set aside for tribes. 
there are um, tribal set-asides for tribal energy loans. There is money through Department of Interior to electrify housing and get more housing to zero emission. And zero emission simply means that you're building a really tight envelope, high energy efficiency, and put on solar or some source of renewable. So all told, your house is not taking from the grid. It is producing energy and high, high energy efficiency. So there's that. There's more for tribal climate resilience. Uh, Native Hawaiian uh, climate resilience, get a set aside. Okay, next slide. So the rebates, this seems, this, this is really exciting and seems to be a place where uh, we have been in conversations with Department of Energy about how to connect to TDAT to let them know um, about this program and get engaged with the tribe. There's 225, there's money sent to the state, and then there's 225 million that will be sent to tribes. And DOE finished tribal consultation this spring on how to allocate that to tribes. And they'll be working on probably some type of formula and making funding determinations for tribes. And so the tribes will directly administer this program. Um, and the rebates will be available through 2031. Here you can see specific rebates that will be available depending on what type of appliance you put in. Um, so there's lots, lots of appliances. Um, and there's also non-appliance upgrades. So it can also serve for rewiring, um, insulation. And here's up to $14,000 in rebate for low or moderate income homeowners. So those are people with incomes of less than 150% of AMI. So once this gets rolling out, you can see how this would greatly have a big impact on a rehab program or just serving needs. Okay, next slide. Let's see, and more. <laughs> then there's this big, big investment through EPA in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is $27 billion. Uh, to mobilize financing and leverage private capital for clean energy and climate projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there's an emphasis on projects that benefit low income and disadvantaged communities. And throughout all the funding from Bill and IRA, there is, and you know, I imagine that's why we see more specific tribal set aside, but there's an emphasis on serving low and moderate income communities. Um, an administrative direction for agencies to have that be 40% of their funding overall. So we're directing there. So there are three main grant programs that are being set under this. Uh, Solar for All, and that is $7 billion. And there is a notice of intent. This says no code demo, but actually it's a Notice of intent deadline of August 28th for tribes. And there, um, and then there is a deadline for them to apply. But this funding is to really increase community solar and um, just, uh, just, just jumpstart kind of the solar, solar, um, solar use, especially for low income. There are also these two other big chunks and I have a harder time explaining them because I don't really understand them. <laughs> but they are, one of them is the Clean Investment Fund and that's 14 billion. And this will fund two to three national nonprofits that will then re-grant, re-deliver, re-loan this um, to communities. And thirdly is the Clean Communities Investment Acceler Accelerator. And this is $6 billion with two to seven hub nonprofits and uh, native CDFIs are eligible. Um, and those two programs, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're somewhere in the process, but the announcements haven't gone out or anything like that. Um, but that is to 
you know, the intent here is to really provide a catalyst of financing. Okay, next slide. Tax credits. Um, it's not, it's not word enough. Treasury gets in the game um, with some tax credits. And the energy tax credit you base, you can get 30% if prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. And then there are these bonuses that they've added on, which means that a housing a project could get up to 70% in tax credits. And through tribal consultation, Treasury heard tribal feedback that saying like they need a way to access those funds since they don't pay federal income tax. That's the typical way these tax credits work. So there is a direct pay. And this is really big because it will allow tribes and Alaskan Native corporations to get money directly for these um, types of projects. And there's tons of um, information and guidance out there, and Treasury is in the midst of rulemaking around this. Um, you know, they have guidance on what is a low-income residential building by statute. This includes TDHE-supported buildings. So you can see how, depending upon the project, you could get a lot of um, tax credits. And you can stack these tax credits with other funding sources. So you can stack them with loans, for instance, from the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program or Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. You could add on those rebates. You could maybe access some solar for all money through EPA greenhouse gas reduction funds or use our, um, our funds. And one of the things that we're working on is developing guidance possibly a webinar, just to make uh, tribes and TDHEs aware of all this funding and how it could fit for the types of projects that we typically fund. Okay, so next slide is stacking the funds. So I guess I already talked about it, but as you can see, if you did rooftop solar on TDHE houses, it is possible that you could get up to a 70% tax credit kind of depends a little bit on um, the tribe's location and, and other such as to what they want to go to. And you can add on that other federal support. So, you know, you can really see how tribes will be able to leverage the funding that's out there to improve their lives and, and improve the, the amount of housing stock that, that they can produce and support. Okay, next slide. There's also climate resilience funding. Um, and so right now I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the funding through BIA. Um, so there's three communities that are pilot projects where in Utah and the Pakiak, Alaska and Quinault Nation in Washington. And overall they're getting $25 million uh, through 638 contracts to plan and implement their move and I'll talk a little bit more about our role within that um, process. And BIA also allocated planning grants for possible relocation to, um, to these other slides, including some in the lower 48. Okay, next slide please on our sections. So what are we doing on all of this? There's a lot of intra and interagency coordination on program development. So, you know, we're talking to DOE to connect them to TDHEs for the rebate program. We're sharing information that might be of use as they develop and deploy programs. Um, we talk, we, in the pre-launch of these programs, we're engaged as a department and own apps at the table to share information, make sure that our grantees are considered as these programs are developed so that it works for um, tribes and TDHEs. We are sharing funding opportunities. You're seeing a lot being pushed out by, by CODOC 
um, just to share awareness. And we're working closely with BIA and community driven relocation. Big hats off to Greg and Jolene up in Alaska and Tom for their ongoing efforts. Um, these reload plant, these relocation pilots have weekly meetings and it's an all of government approach trying to figure out what the needs are and who can contribute and how to make it work holistically. Uh, we also, I'm also working with Greg and Jolene with uh, technical assistance funding uh, to support climate planning needs for Alaskan villages. And so we're working with the Alaska Native Tribal Housing Consortium to develop a needs assessment for up to 15 villages. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we developed, this is our, we do have a web page on tribal climate resilience and adaptation. This has links to information that is tribal centered. There are a lot of places that have specific data and information that is specific to tribes. And so this just, uh, is kind of a curated place to find those more prevalent um, hubs of information. And so some of the, it also includes funding information from the University of Oregon's funding base, a little bit about our program information, how it could be used, um, as well as BIA's climate resilience program. And some of the FEMA, I call it steady state programs, these are the ones that aren't part of the New money coming out in the bill or the IRA, this is just ongoing money um, that tribes are eligible for, including the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities or Brick Tilt uh, Program and tribes, there is a $50 million set aside. And this helps tribes build capacity and undertake hazard mitigation projects to reduce risk from disaster, so before it happens. And then there's hazard mitigation grants which um, also are available for tribes. And there's case studies within the next slide, please. So just a look at the website. Here's some of the different um, tools, resources, and profiles that it has on here. Next slide, please. Oh, I forgot there, I made an animation. <laughs> so going into one of the tools is sustainable construction in Indian country. Uh, next slide, please, where it shows the sustainable construction. This is a PDNR project um, that was developed in 2013 and 2014. And although it's a little bit old, it still has a lot of really good case studies and best practices and reports. Next slide, please. Okay, BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Program. So I talked a little bit about the money that's this um, doubling out to specific tribes, but there's also, they also have just a standing resilience program and a standard resilience funding program. And one of the things that I do like about this um, website from BIA, <laughs> you get this kind of remarkable to me because sometimes I find BIA a mystery, but you can go through it to find the BIA regional uh, contacts for your information for your area. And so it gives an actual name of an actual person to talk to about their resources. Next slide. Next slide. The, the next the slide that <laughs> I'd like is the general tools and resources where University of Oregon is in red. I hope I'm lined up with the slides, I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to, to dive into the University of Oregon uh, Climate Change Project website, it is pointed to also in the U.S. climate assessment um, tool. So, so this is a robust website and it's just chock full of amazing stuff. So next slide. So looking at it, um, if you orientate yourself, you can see that there are tabs kind of across the top. So I'm going to go into the first three tabs here. But this is the first tab of funding. So I snapshot this, you know, I guess prob probably a week ago, a week ago or so. So now it will look different, but you can look by keywords, by geography, 
and it has different, um, all different kinds of funding availability from federal to non-federal. Okay. Danielle, Quick just again. one moment, Danielle. Yeah. I'm on the climate resources page. Was that the right page or was it a different one? It was uh, right after the you... BIA tribal profiles. It looks like it's on HUD exchange. Yep. Okay. Next, next slide. Okay. And that okay. is Spokane gonna... tribe. Yeah. Wait, what? Maybe I'm, maybe the animation didn't go through. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, probably not. Oh, okay. That makes sense now. Okay. Sorry, guys. I had the set up to kind of animate to go through, but all this to say that the University of Oregon has just so many great things from tribal adaptation plans to funding resources. So it's really great. Um, okay. So if you could go back to climate resources or make sure we're there. So, in addition to um, ONAP's website, which is tribally focused, HUD has launched a Build for the Future webpage that encompasses throughout all the programs, um, all of the guidance, all of the tools, all of the things from housing, public housing, community planning and development, and, and ONAP too, um, and this will be a place where people can find funding opportunities, guidance materials, and coming soon there will be a funding navigator where um, it will it will have some tool that will enable tribes and other grantees to identify themselves. Like, so I think it's being built out so you can identify yourself as a tribe and figure out what federal funds you're eligible for. Um, just I think we're all acknowledging that there's just so much money out there. It's so hard to keep track of and um, navigate. So when that funding navigator is out um, and when they've, um, we'll be promoting this website a little bit more. For right now, it's a little bit heavy. It's actually very heavy on multifamily projects. Um, so, so we're hoping to also kind of build that out with some of the uh, more projects that, that we might touch. Okay, next slide. Okay, we'll end with some pictures. This is the Spokane tribe, and I don't know if uh, Northwest or, or Tom is on the call. I know that recently had a ribbon cutting for phase two, but this is a project that gets a lot of conversation at NAIHC. It was referenced in several presentations, um, and, you know, it involves uh, installing solar panels on 23 homes and nine essential buildings. Uh, this is a tribe that had a lost homes. I think 14 to 15 homes were destroyed during a wildfire. So this is, you know, building back, building back better with solar. And it's approximated that they'll save 2.8 million over the 25 year lifespan on the PV system. And our funds were used as technical assistance to help kind of pull together all these funds. Uh, next slide. This is from the sustainable, um, sustainable building in the country. This is an example of sustainable rural housing in the Northern China and how our funds were used to help uh, make a house that has earth banking, full walls, adjustable movable foundations, and um, it's just much more energy efficient. Next slide. So what can you do? Um, so one thing, you know, we don't have extra funding from any of these bills, although optimistic to hear about next year's um, appropriations, but our funds are part of the solution here. And as you can see, we there will be opportunities to stack and leverage funds. Um, and, you know, so talking about our programs and how those could be used with other folks is really important. So distributing and sharing information. Um, one thing ONAP did commit to is to support technical assistance requests that come through for climate and energy renewable. We know we didn't get a lot of extra funding, but 
we do have TA funds that can be used. And the final thing is help us tell the story. Um, we're looking for tries and case studies where HUD funded projects were done that include energy efficiency, renewables, climate and resilience. Um, Jeff Blackwell, he, I'm not sure if he's on the call, but he is helping out as well to try to um, dig into these and he'll be reaching out to you um, to write them up. HUD's looking for to build out its uh, por portfolio of successful projects and I know we have some. And if you have any questions about any of this, um, here's my email on the screen and just reach out to me. That's it. Thank you, Danielle. Great job. Really appreciate all of your passion and commitment to making sure that these resources are getting out to the tribes and TDHEs. And so, as Danielle mentioned, your assistance in the field is really helpful in terms of making sure folks hear about it because sometimes it doesn't get to the right people. And if you're able to make those connections, then that really helps ensure that these funds get utilized. Thank you, Danielle. Appreciate it. And as she mentioned, please reach out to her with any questions you have. She's excellent to work with and just love her passion. And just want to just want to um, reiterate what Gary Cooper had mentioned early on is that this agenda was informed by the administrators and staff. And so we are touching on topics that you all brought to the table for today's session. Our next presentation is a GEMS gem demonstration from Thorne. And Thorne has been our data guru from day one. And so I'm sure he's very excited to share with you this next iteration of our data collection system. So Thorne, I will turn it over to you and you can start sharing your screen. All right, thanks Iris. Uh, I'll share that in just a second. Um, I'm Thorne Druck, uh, most of you know me. Um, I'm with uh, Headquarters Operations. Um, I've been leading the effort to move uh, to the GEM system from the current EPIC and PTD systems. Uh, PTD is not a system, but we're We'll let that slide. Um, and uh, I, I definitely couldn't do it without the incredible uh, help of the GEMS transition team that we have in place. Um, I got accused of doing an Oscar speech the last time. So I, you all know who you are and more importantly, your supervisors know who you are. Uh, the GEMS transition team has been incredible in this effort and getting us to where we are, absolutely. Um, as you all know, GEMS is, is coming and soon. Uh, we've just set up onboarding planning meetings for all the remaining regions. Uh, and our target date for release of all of the current GEMS system to those regions is the end of September. And thank you to all the administrators for identifying the super users and coordinators to help us with that effort. Uh, we really appreciate it. We just started those meetings this week. Um, we've also been holding GEMS office hours with the grantees that are in the system. In fact, there's one coming up in about a half an hour that I'm going to try and get to. <laughs> so, uh, to quote Willy Wonka, uh, we have so much time and so little to do. Uh, but um, let me share my screen here. Hold on. So, uh, let me get some more. So, how do you know you're official? Well, when Google says you're official, you're official. So, we have a, you can search on Google for ONAP Gems. We have our webpage. Here it is. Uh, it has a link to the grantee login, although they should also have that themselves. Right. Yes. Not seeing oh, your screen at the oh, moment. Seeing, seeing the wrong screen. Let me try that again. Um, oh, or, or you're not seeing any screen. There we go. Yeah, here Let's we see. go. It looks like you are sharing content. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I keep forgetting to click that last button. Anyway, uh, here's the Google. If you Google ONAB Gems, you can see they come up. 
and this is the uh, the grantee page. Uh, they have a link, which again they should get in an email when they set up. Uh, but also it's linked here. We have links to um, that's for their login. We have links to the uh, FAQ, the user guide, some trainings that we've done, and uh, our basically our email hotline for any questions. When they click on this link, they go to the login page uh, for GEMS. And uh, if they're already set up in the system, they'll put in their username, which is their email that they're using and their password. If they uh, have been booted out of the system because they haven't logged in for too long, they can usually just reset their password right here, uh, or the super users in their office can also reset their password. Um, if they have not yet gone into GEMS and they need to set up an account in GEMS, they can click here on sign up. And the first thing they have to do is select their region. And so we collect a bunch of information from them up front to get them into the system. Uh, first, they would put in their um, Oh, I selected the wrong region. Let's see. So, yeah, Colombian Nation, for instance. So, they would, so the drop down list is based on the grantees that we have in the system. They'd fill in their information here. It's important that they indicate if they are the primary contact, meaning the executive director or the chairperson or what have you. There should only be one primary contact for each entity. Um, it's important for them to uh, let us know if it's a new account or reauthorization, or if they want us to disable a person, we've added that capability in here as well. Um, if somebody leaves the organization, for instance, um, it's also important for them to uh, let us know if they're replacing somebody, we put that in here. and what type of access they're requesting. So whether they just want to be able to read the plans, uh, whether they want to uh, create and edit plans, or whether they want to be able to sign and submit plans. And if they have the sign and submit authority, they can also create and read. If they have the create and edit, they can also read. Um, so they fill out all of this information and it comes into GEMS and gets reviewed by our staff. The, GE specialist, GM specialist, uh, or above. And then once they verify that that's a person that we want associated with that grantee in the system, they can click a button and it automatically adds them to the GEM system for that grantee to be able to read and write uh, plans or sign uh, grant agreements, whatever they've indicated in here. And we've, we've built in as much flexibility as we can in here so that the grantees can uh, indicate their own preferences for how things get submitted. Uh, and we've tried to emulate the flexibility that we had in EPIC to as much uh, a degree as we possibly could. Um, so that's the login page. Once they log in, and I've got, hold on. Put something in the way of my tab here. Once they log in, they'll see a home screen and it will display all their tasks. I'm logged in currently as uh, the possible Yaki chairperson. Um, this is in the test system. So Jody, if you're on, don't worry. Uh, um, it should display all the tasks that they have coming up, all the SF425s that they have due any uh, plans or APRs that they're working on. I'll show you that in a second. Um, for instance here, if they wanted to turn in this uh, 2023 IHPG SF425, they could drop down there and edit and fill in all the information for the SF425, save and submit. Um, on this, task screen, they've got lots of ways to sort. Uh, they can run it by just, I just want to see which one is 23 year, 24 year. They can sort and filter by any of these options. 
We can also just sort alphabetically by just clicking on any of these buttons uh, to, you know, as these lists get longer or cumbersome, they can sort and find what they need. From uh, on the home screen also, they have their upcoming deadlines listed all up in here. Uh, this had an issue recently, but that's been fixed fortunately, where it was showing uh, deadlines for uh, if they were TDHE, it was showing some of the deadlines for the tribe as well. We've gotten that all squared away. Um, up here at the top are the various options that they can uh, do in GEMS. They can click on organization. Um, they can look at their organization and see all the information that we have in GEMS about their organization, uh, including all the contacts that are registered for that organization. Now, as I'm in the test system uh, and I'm just logged in as Peter right now, um, we, there's only one contact here, but there would be multiple if uh, if they had multiple in the system. And I, and I can click on that contact information and see the details of that contact information. Um, as you can see, Peter has my email address here because I'm in test, but. Uh, they uh, are not able to edit this information. We have a note asking them to contact us if there are any changes. We're trying to go back to that now, but so there we go. Please contact. And that way we keep the system up to date with their information. Uh, that note's right. Um, there is a NOFA section that's not working yet. That will, as we build out GEMS with grant programs, uh, we'll build out that section. Um, when they want to submit an IHP or APR, they come in here to the new submissions tab. They tell us what they're submitting. I'm going to submit an annual performance report for 2023. And the system creates the document for them. And here's the cover page. It should look familiar to everybody pretty much. Um, they can click through any of the tabs that they want. They don't have to go in sequential order. So I've come over here to tab 12, and then I'm going to skip back to tab 6. This is an APR, so not all the tabs are represented because the other ones would be filled out in the IHP. Uh, and you see when I click off of section 12 there, it's telling me that there was something that I should have filled out there that is, is still needing data. So if I go back to that tab, that's highlighted here in red, something that would be required. Uh, section 6 now has something that's required, but if they go to review and submit this plan, they can submit it with errors, uh, as we know that they need to do. Uh, they would put in the name of the authorized submitter here and an e-signature here. Um, uh, and then when once they have submitted that plan, or actually once they've even started that plan, if you go back to the home screen here, you see that it shows up here. And they can go back in and edit whatever they've started. Um, once they've submitted the plans, it'll show up here for the APRs. And they can, and the screen gets crunched sometimes, they can go to any of these submitted documents. They can print those. They can also print the in-process ones. Uh, oh, well, I can't show you that right now, sorry. But it does work, I promise, we've tested it. <laughs> um, there's also an awards tab. This is where their grant agreements will come in when they're ready for signature. Uh, this compliance is not something we're using at this point. Um, Cases is a way for the grantees to communicate back and forth with HUD um, about a particular subject. So they can create a case and tell us what the subject is and 
send it in gems and we can track the resolution of that issue within gems. Um, and then of course, there's the downloadable form section, which has the signature attestation page that we're requiring with gems now. Uh, that tells us that whoever's submitting this document, whoever they've said is authorized to sign, is uh, has an authorized has a one-time signature on file with us. We'll upload that document when they download it and sign it. We'll upload it to that person's uh, page. They don't have to submit it every year. They can just submit it once. This kind of takes the place of the whole secure sign-on process. Um, we don't the secure systems process rather. We don't. We're not using secure systems for this so that we don't have to deal with the people getting kicked out as much and, and so forth. They still do meet the HUD guidelines in terms of getting locked out after a certain amount of time, but it's very easy to reset their password and everything. Um, there's also the tribal certification form here. If they're a TDHE, they would download this, make sure each tribe they represent fills that out. Uh, to show that they're authorized to submit the plan for the tribe. And that's pretty much it on the tribal side. Um, so once they've submitted a plan uh, or, or an SF-425, it'll come into the HUD side. On the HUD side, and please note, um, the, the, the places where the, the systems are entirely different for the uh, tribal side and for the HUD side. So there's an entirely different web address for the grantees to log in and an entirely different web address for HUD to, to log in. And that's important because they really are two totally different systems doing to two totally different things, but they communicate with each other. Um, so uh, HUD sign-on is now single sign-on and I'm going into the live system for this to, to show you this. Um, when you click log in, it should take you straight into the system. Oh, I'm going to have to put in my, because I'm not on um, VPN, I'm going to have to put in my ID here. Uh oh. Let me try that again. One second. And just to time check that, we probably have a couple more minutes. Yeah, I'm okay, so I will try to be really fast then. Um, so this is this is the gem system. When you come in, um, you'll see on your home screen. Uh, your portfolio is things that are assigned to you. I don't, I won't have anything here because I don't have anything assigned. Um, there's some nomenclature that everybody's going to have to get used to. Uh, we're putting this in the, in the guidebooks. Accounts are basically the uh, grantees. GEMS form submissions are basically the IHPs and APRs. GEMS required submissions are the SF425s. Packages are the grant agreements uh, and communications that go back and forth for signature. Uh, and let me show you one of those. Uh, since we're short on time, I'm going to have to truncate things here. Um, so, for instance, this is, uh, let's see here. This is one of the documents that we just recently sent through. Uh, GEMS. Um, so this is for four pack housing authority. It was e signed in the system by Randall Akers and then e signed by the uh, executive director and sent. Uh, it automatically once once Randall uh, signed it in GEMS, it goes into a queue. Um, for distribution, it doesn't get automatically sent out because we wanted to be able to send them out in bulk or hold some back. Uh, you can uh, check a bunch of boxes. You can check all the boxes or just a few uh, or just one and send the grant agreement out. Uh, again, it gets signed by the um, 
administer or the ED here and then sent back in the gem system. And then we sent it automatically up to Fort Worth. Now, there were some bugs in the system uh, with this one, but those have all been ironed out. And uh, Fort Worth is absolutely accepting this e signature from uh, uh, for these documents. They have loaded this document and the other one that we processed into the lock system at this point. Uh, so that should all be going smoothly um, at this point. Um, I guess since we're short on time, I will kind of wrap it up here. But uh, this, uh, uh, let me see. Um, so when, when you're in the gem system, I just want to show you real quick. If you, uh, there's lots of ways to navigate around and we understand this is going to take some getting used to because it is a very complex system combining both elements of the PTD and the EPIC system. But you can, it, it's a very, very, uh, it, it, there are many, many ways to do things. So you, you'll be able to find a way that works for you. Like right there, I just searched for Fort Peck. There's all the Fort Peck information. If I wanted to look at related things to Fort Peck, I could see all of their IHP and APR submissions. I could see all of their grants. I could see all of their SF-425s. This actually will be their uh, travel head vanish at some point. I can see all of their contact information, et cetera, and any of the communications that they've sent, that sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's a very comprehensive system. Um, we, are, as I said, working to onboard all the grantees by the end of September. We are also uh, currently working on what we're calling release two, uh, which will more or less cover all the GE functions, including risk assessments, audits, enforcement, et cetera. Uh, our goal is to not have to build any more pass back to the PTD because that uh, effort has just taken up an inordinate amount of work. Um, so we're trying to get everything in the gem system that would otherwise require that aspect of information. Um, and that's the idea. Um, and I guess I'll wrap it up there. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, Thorn. I remember the days when it was an Excel spreadsheet. So we've come a long ways. Indeed. Yeah, and I'm really excited about the function where you can pull information for the tribal profiles. That makes things a lot easier as well. So great job. Thank you. All right, next we are going into our new staff profiles. And I know that we had a question and someone wanted a update on how to um, sign up for the Code Talk listserv. So what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I'm going to put the link in the chat. And if you are a new staff person, you can click on that link, put in your name and your email address, and then you'll receive all of the Code Talk updates that we send out via Gov Delivery or via email. So that is in the chat. Um, we're gonna move now to new staff profiles. And so I will be calling on our administrators to do the new staff introductions. And I will start with our first one. Our Office of Performance and Planning is very pleased to welcome Kristen Arnold. She's a Native American program specialist and joined us on July 3rd. And we have made sure she got her feet wet very quickly. And she is working with our Tribal Intergovernmental Advisory Committee helping them get organized and set up their meetings and those types of things. And so she previously worked for a state housing finance agency. She's worked for HUD field offices in Indianapolis and in Portland. She previously worked for HUD headquarters in PIH. <laughs> and now she is, um, and also had some work experience with ABCP and Denali Commission in Alaska. So fun fact about Kristen is that when she was 12, her brother won a trip to the Nickelodeon studios in California from a Rugrats promotion on a Lunchable. So now you know, folks, when you see those on the Lunchable, you need to go ahead and sign up for it. 
So why does she do what she do? So Kristen states that she loves the mission, travel and connection to communities all over the country. And although the employee viewpoint surveys may say otherwise, HUD is a good place to work. Thank you, Kristen, and welcome to the team. Happy to have you on board. I'll go ahead and cover these because I did not see Krista Johnson online. And so we have new staff in the Office of Loan Guarantee, and those positions are based out of headquarters in Washington, D.C. We have Shakita Howard Daniels. Her hometown is Montgomery, Alabama, and she currently resides in Smyrna, Georgia. Previously worked with, she was with the United States Army and Department of Veterans Affairs and was a veteran service representative. A fun fact about Shakita is that she loves to travel and experience different cultures. And why she does what she does is she has a passion for helping others in their time of need. She enjoys the sense of purpose and making a positive impact on others' lives. Welcome Shakita, we're happy to have you. And we have Megan Murray. Megan Murray is a loan guarantee specialist, also in the Office of Loan Guarantee. Her hometown is Tecumseh, Oklahoma, and she's currently in Bedford, Texas. Her previous experience, uh, she's been a mortgage servicer for 17 years. Servicers include Buck Financial and City Mortgage. Fun fact, she loves to travel. Her husband, and her got engaged in Paris on the Eiffel Tower and married by Elvis in Las Vegas. Wow, so very exciting. And why she does what she does. She said, it feels good to know that the work I'm doing allows servicers to continue offering safe and affordable housing options and workouts to help borrowers keep their homes. Excellent, Megan, thank you so much. And we are so happy to have you on board. Next, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Stuckey for the next introduction. Thanks, Iris. I'll, I'll let you keep messing with the PowerPoint moving forward, please. And welcome all you guys over at headquarters. Glad to see y'all there. I see ABCP Inc. So it's always great to see some headquarters staff with some Alaska experience. So Kristen, good to see you there. Um, I got two new staff. Uh, Mercedes Angerman is a grants management specialist uh, she's from Wrangell, Alaska, which is a small, quaint fishing town in southeast Alaska. You've seen those pictures. She's got two monster cohos in her hands. Uh, she's already had her career with the state of Alaska for 34 years. Um, she started doing volunteering when she retired, and that just wasn't quite enough for her. Uh, and so she's starting her second career with ONAP and we're excited to have her. She was an ARP specialist for two years uh, before she got this. <laughs> grants management specialist, permanent position. I think she's in her second week now as a permanent grants management specialist. So glad to have you, Mercedes. It says here that she's a recent mother of two Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. So congratulations on that. Uh, I had a Cocker Spaniel when I was growing up and she has corrected me. Those are King Salmon couldn't quite get a good look at them. Uh, and that's Mercedes Angerman. So I'm glad to have her on the team. We can next slide, we'll have uh, Janet Prescott. Um, you know, she's originally from Florida. She lives in Anchorage. She's been in Alaska for a long, long time. Uh, she was a chef and uh, owned her own catering company for, it says 14 years. I knew about that for a long time. Previous to that, she had some mortgage lending experience. Uh, she came on as an ARP specialist as well, uh, was here for two years um, as an ARP specialist and then a permanent GE specialist came up and she's pretty sure she's in her second week as a permanent grants evaluation specialist as well. Uh, she's a, a great fit for us. We're excited to have her. Uh, and I love that, you know, why she does what she does is uh, hopes of helping her grantees uh, be successful. So I appreciate both of y'all coming in and I'll turn it over to whoever is next in line. And Greg, if you want to turn on your video and just wave, say hi to everyone so our new staff can see you. There's Greg. He's the administrator for the Alaska Office of Native American Programs. And Greg, you've been there for probably decades. 
Okay. All right. Next up, we have. Thank you, Greg. Next up, we have Neil Weifgall, who is our new administrator in the Eastern Woodlands Office of Native American Programs. So I will turn it over to Neil and feel free to turn on your camera so folks can see you. Oh, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Neil Weifgall, or Wakanjazi Ngaide is my, uh, my Ho-Chuck name, um, or my name. <laughs> um, but um, I am, uh, yeah, I'm coming to uh, Eastern Woodlands office as an administrator, and I've had experience being an executive director for uh, Ho Chunk Housing and Community Development Agency. Um, you know, for for I think like well, I was the director for about ten years, and before that, I was in uh, develop. I was development director and, and, and served a couple of functions in the tribe before, so. Thank you, everyone, for welcoming me to to HUD. And you know, it's very welcoming. Uh, you know, people uh, are, are very, very great here. And um, yeah, so my uh, uh, fun fact that I have on here is is uh, making too much food for family gatherings. Uh, and, and you know, that's my specialty. So I make too much food, and and my it, my wife hates it. You know, hates that I make too much food for family gatherings. But um, you know. Why I do what I do, you know, and, and it says here, you know, helping our tribal communities with affordable housing, it's just, it's so fulfilling, uh, you know, and, and what we do, you know, and, and I, I said it on here is, is we, you know, what we do with our hearts and, and you know, and kind of our minds, it, it does help people out there in our, in our tribal communities. And uh, so that's where I'm, I'm hoping to uh, continue that, that, uh, you know, helping, you know, all, all across the region and, Thank you. Um, next, uh, if that, that's my introduction, um, like to, so I think we have John Sharekas slide. Uh, so John is uh, an, a GE specialist and he actually has been working for uh, ONAP for about 11 months now, but he just became permanent full time, or I guess I'm not sure of the, the, the correct uh, language, but he is, so he's technically a new employee. He has years of experience in, in, um, in helping people, uh, comes to us from, from um, I believe, Georgia. Uh, he had worked for different nonprofits and, and state and local agencies in, in, um, in Georgia prior to coming here, uh, re coming back to Chicago. Um, and let's see, he also, he loves to cook and relax to unwind. He is originally from Chicago and he's back here now and he has spent most of his career in Atlanta. And uh, let's see. And he does what he does because the lack of affordable housing is a major issue, and he hopes to be able to contribute to the solution. And he has a, a long, a long history of, of contributing to, to that solution. So we, um, we welcome <laughs> John uh, to, to our to our permanent team. All right, thank you, Neil. Welcome on board. We're happy to have you. It's very exciting that you've joined us. So. Let me turn it over now to Randy Akers with Northern Plains ONAP. Great. Hi, Iris and ONAP Nation. Um, it's well, Iris, can you can you forward the power slide to Polly, please? Yeah, it should be on there. Silas, are you seeing Polly Serrano? It is now. Thank okay. you. I think there so might be a my... little bit of a time lag. Sorry. No, no worries. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Polly Serrano, uh, who is one of the newer employees that has joined the Northern Plains Office of Native American Programs team. Uh, Polly's hometown is El Paso, Texas. Her current residence is Centennial. Um, and uh, she has previous experience as grants management at the Colorado University Al uh, Alzheimer's and Cognition Center. Uh, one fun fact uh, about Polly is uh, she loves to cook and to care for her indoor plants, especially the tropical plants. And why she does what she does is she enjoys aiding organizations with the grant process from start to finish. It is rewarding to see how the grant uh, helps communities uh, after the project is completed. We're really happy that, that Polly's a part of the Northern Plains team. So welcome, Polly. 
Thank you. Thank you, Randy. If you don't mind turning on your video, just waving hi to everyone, our new employees. So, hi, folks. There he is. <laughs> hi, Randy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And next slide, please. All right. I'm going to turn it over to David Boyd, who's filling in for Tom Carney, who is out in the field today. David, go ahead. Thank you, Iris. Uh, my name is David Boyd. I'm the director with the uh, Grants Management Division with the Northwest Office of the Native American Programs. And on your screen right now is Ms. Linda O'Rourke. She's a Grants Evaluation Specialist. True to the fact that she will be starting that position here on Monday, she is wrapping up her duties as a Grants Management Specialist LTE ARP. So she was working with me and the staff, actually both sides of, of uh, the GM and GE staff for uh, a little over coming up on a year now here soon to be. And uh, she is from a hometown out of Montana and her current residence is in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, she brings back a lot of experience because of FEMA, the Census 2020 Economic Development Administration, and uh, with that, a nonprofit grant writer and uh, land planner, which is going to fit her perfect for the grants evaluation specialist position that she was hired for. A fun fact about Linda is that she is a foodie, and chocolate is uh, her soul food, and it really is. She has brought to the office some uh, wonderful chocolate. Uh, sometimes I'm not able to enjoy that only because of my diet, but other than that, it's it's wonderful. Uh, she enjoys uh, recipes from Star Wars. Uh, I definitely would like to see that. Maybe you'll have a potluck and we'll see what happens there. Uh, the Elder Scrolls and the Feast of Fire and Ice Cookbooks. Why does she do what she does? Is her heart is helping people. And that's true to the fact, too, because when she comes to work, you hear it, you see it, and it shows in her work, it shows in her writing. Um, and she is definitely a pleasure to work with. Um, she loves helping tribal communities and serving the public in her new role as a grants evaluation specialist. And she also is uh, a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Please welcome Linda O'Rourke. Excellent, next slide, please. Just recently hired is Mr. Clint Zarnowski. Um, had the pleasure of meeting him back when we were doing the interview, and he was uh, it was really thrilling to interview him and and talk with him and speak with him. Um, he is currently in Oregon. He comes from uh, Woodbury, New Jersey. Uh, his previous experience is a program management with USAID, BHA, managing emergency food assistance programs in Ethiopia, and also he has previous experience in uh, Yemen, Syria, and a refugee hosting countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, as you can see, he's a pretty well-traveled individual. A little bit on the jealous side. Um, I love the travel as well. A fun fact, I did not know this until just now, identical twin. That's amazing. So uh, why does he do what he does? I am committed to public service and giving back. I definitely can feel that when we're talking with Clint, and you will as well, if you ever exchange a, a working environment with him or just on a one-on-one -on -one chatting with him. He's a delight to talk to. Um, he's uh, definitely committed to public service and giving back. Plus, uh, six years working with the USAID, providing assistance in other countries, I think it's going to give him a well-rounded uh avenue for how we go out on site visits and working with our tribes and the different uh, uh, communities that he's going to be involved with. I think he's going to fit in just wonderful. And as we're going through and he's learning our ONAP business processes for the Grants Management Division, he's a quick learn and I really enjoy that. So please, everybody, welcome Clint Zarnowski. All right, thank you, David, and welcome, Clint and Linda. I'm going to turn it over now to, we can go to the next slide. I'm going to turn it now over to David Sutherland, who is the administrator for the Southern Plains ONAP office. And I want to thank you all for sticking with us. Um, we'll probably go another 10 minutes, so appreciate you getting to meet the other staff, people who have recently joined us. David, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, 
First up is Rhonda States. She's a grants evaluation specialist. She, her hometown is Edmond, Oklahoma. She currently lives in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and her background's been in Indian casino accounting, tribal accounting, and government contract accounting. Uh, she loves to travel, especially cruises. And uh, she says, I'm proud of my Indian heritage and enjoy helping the Indian tribes. Next slide. By the way, Dina told me I had to be really fast. Uh, Michelle Gilbert Green, she's a grants management specialist. Uh, hometown is Boley, Oklahoma. She currently lives in Shawnee, Oklahoma. She worked for the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. And uh, she absolutely loves Christmas. So we'll be expecting something coming up pretty soon. Uh, I have wanted to work for HUD for 10 years and kept persevering until Sherry Coleman gave me an opportunity. Uh, she loves working with her tribes and providing them with all the needed resources and researching other needs they may have. Welcome, Michelle. Next slide. Jeremy Maurer, uh, Grants Management special, Specialist. Uh, he was born in Eskin, that word, California, <laughs> Escondido, uh, raised around the U.S. because father was in the Marine Corps. He does have lots of good stories. Currently lives in Oklahoma City. Uh, before he came to Sponap, he was working with USAID, State Department, and various NGOs in uh, whatever that stands for. I'm not sure what that stands for. In different countries around the globe, uh, he once went gorilla trekking with silverback gorillas in Rwanda. Uh, Why well, he does what he does, uh, I do what I do because I've seen how development has helped people and want to be a part of that. So uh, I don't know where he's at right there with the bananas he's holding, but uh, looks pretty intriguing. Uh, next slide. Terrence Jacobs, a uh, grants management specialist. Uh, he's from Augusta, Georgia. Currently lives in Moore, Oklahoma. He was a contract manager for the Department of the Air Force. He's a big foodie person. Uh, he's always trying to find new restaurants to try. He also likes uh, uh, going to car shows, and as you can see, he has one he takes, and uh, uh, he told me I could borrow it if I could drive a standard. Of course, I can, so I will be borrowing his car. Uh, he loves uh, helping his tribes to, uh, to be able to provide for their tribal members. Next slide. Angelique Williams, uh, her home, she's a grants evaluation specialist. Uh, she's from Kanawha, Oklahoma, lives in Hera, Oklahoma. Uh, she's uh, been an uh, internal auditor for Tribal Housing Authority and Telecommunications. She loves to cook and be outdoors. And uh, what does she do? What she does? She, being a grants evaluation specialist, allows her to help uh, our grantees while continuing housing journey. Representing HUD while helping others is rewarding and truly an honor. I think I got at least one more, maybe two more. Ken Jones, grants evaluation specialist. Uh, he, uh, his hometown Shawnee, it's where he re re resides. He uh, worked 23 years with the absentee Shawnee tribe as the director of the, the environmental stuff. Uh, and primarily, he was over, overseeing the ICDBG program. Uh, fun fact, I uh, started out as a commercial art major, received an uh, associate's degree, and then made a quick right turn. Apparently, that didn't go well. So uh, he does really enjoy the ICDBG process from writing the grant on behalf of the tribe, gathering data, completing the environmental assessments, and overseeing the construction project on site to its completion. Next slide. And Brenda Claw, she's from uh, Round Rock, Arizona. Uh, current residence in Norman, Oklahoma. Home of the Oklahoma Sooners, by the way. Uh, previous experience, she's worked for the Census Bureau. She's been a Tribal Housing Authority Executive Director and Finance Manager, uh, Tribal Health Finance Director. She enjoys traveling and seeing new places and um, Having been on the other side as a grant recipient, my new role as a grants evaluation specialist allows me to be a liaison between North, uh, Native American tribes, 
uh, TDHEs and HUD and to continue to serve Native American communities. Next slide. Oh, that's uh, someone else. Uh, okay. Just the headquarters uh, for, for all the new staff that we have in, uh, in the, the funding for uh, the tribes that's going up, that's not by accident. That's hard work from the headquarters staff uh, telling the Hill what we can do and then the, the field and headquarters together carrying out the mission. So uh, heads up or a, a shout out to all the folks out there that had uh, that's been doing a great job. Thanks. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Okay, and now we have Shane Begay, who joins us as Grants Management Director for the Southwest ONAP team. His hometown, he's an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, was born and raised in Northern Arizona on the Navajo Nation, and he currently resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's worked previously for the National American Indian Housing Council, most recently as a Training and Technical Assistance Program Manager, and possesses extensive knowledge of tribal governments and relationships with the US government, including knowledge of tribal laws, treaties, executive orders, federal trust responsibilities, and tribal government to government consultation requirements. Shane is a graduate of Brigham Young University and has a degree in political science. Fun fact, Shane has been married to his wife, Tara, for seven years, and they have two beautiful daughters. Thank you, Shane. We're so excited to have you on board and welcome to everyone who's just joined us recently. Um, the Office of Native American Programs is a great place to work and the work that we do impacts so many lives. So I'm just really grateful that you all are joining us and just wanna welcome you. Please reach out if you have any needs for anything, we're always happy to help get you acclimated. Um, I do have a public service announcement from Bryce Harper who just reminds people to update staff in the PTD for all positions. Okay, and we are going to our final session, which is to take a look and hear from our existing staff. So we have a lot of seasoned staff who've been with HUD a number of years. They have extremely great experience and they're the people you wanna reach out to if you have any questions. And so I'm gonna ask the existing staff to introduce themselves and you will be able to uh, open up your video if you choose to do so and unmute yourself. So first off, we have Paula Lacasse. Lacasse, um, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and remind me how to pronounce your last name. Paula, are you with us? Okay, we can come back to Paula if she's on. I'm gonna go now to Anthony Fletcher, who's a grants evaluation specialist at the Eastern Woodlands Office of Native American Programs. And I do see Anthony. Are you there, Anthony? Hello. Hi, we hear you. Uh, yes, I'm Anthony Fletcher, Grants Evaluation Specialist at Eastern uh, ENAP. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I've been with uh, ONAP for a year and maybe one month. Uh, like like it says, I enjoy playing percussions and, you know, I got a little fellow over there with me that wanted to learn. I was learning from him, actually. So. Uh, those some of the things I enjoy doing, uh, and I'm here to assist anyone that is newer than myself. Uh, all you have to do is reach out to me, and I try to provide whatever information or resources I can provide. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anthony. So happy to have you on board. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, next up we have David Boyd. Director of Grants Management with Northwest ONAP, David. Iris, thank you. Uh, 
I was just on speaking earlier. Uh, my name is David Boyd. I'm the director with the Grants Management Division with the Northwest Office of Native American Programs. My hometown is in Chilean, Washington, currently residing in Olympia, Washington. I am an enrolled member with the Arrow Lakes Band, a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Northeastern Washington. Uh, my previous experience, uh, I was a tribal housing director for one of our great Northwest tribes. And I went on to the grants management specialist and worked my way up and here I am, director, how about that? Uh, fun fact for me is that uh, I am an avid hitter of the golfing ball, love playing golf. It has taken me around all of the, I guess you could say the United States. Um, I usually play uh, on what is called the Native American uh, amateur tour, I guess you could say. And so we get to, I get to go out and visit a lot of the uh, other nations and, and play on some beautiful courses that they have developed and purchased and uh, meet with um, all staff and community members of the tribes while we're playing. And it's, it's really has assisted me in where I'm moving on in my life as, uh, as the director for the, the Northwest and also have a career that, uh, an activity that I can do well into my elderly age is playing golf. Um, why do I do what I do? Um, I love my job, I really do. Um, I, I grew up on, a, on the Culver Reservation and I understand what affordable housing is. Our needs specifically in the Northwest is definitely different throughout the nation. Um, and it, it, I'm excited to go out and work with them and um, allow my experience of what I have for them to be creative with Nahasda, because Nahasda is a very creative grant. And, you know, we get to sprinkle on our ICDBG and our Rosses and Tribal Hudvash and all the other grants that we get to utilize out there and hopefully benefit and, and move them forward with some of their needs. Um, I think one of the biggest things I do like that I do miss as being supervisor though, versus being the lead or a grants management specialist is actually what I say going out and, and, and playing in the dirt. Um, I, I love going out to reservations and working with them on their policies, their programs, and just offering advice of what they can do with things, how they can twist it. It's, it's, it's just a blast. Um, and I've enjoyed my career here at Northwest. And I do honestly wake up every morning looking forward to going to work. Thank you very much. Back to you, Iris. Oh, thank you, David. That's so awesome. And I believe him thoroughly because he does enjoy the work he does here. And next we have Pamela Kemble, a lead grants management specialist with Sponap. Do we have Pamela on the line, Silas? There she is. Hi, Pamela. Looks like we're just adding you. Hello. All right, Pamela, take it away. Okay, I'm surprised I didn't know I was reading my own. <laughs> um, I just became the lead grants management specialist in June. And I, my hometown is Ponca City, Tacoma, and I am a tribal member of the Ponca tribe. I currently live in Moore, Oklahoma. My previous experience, I started ahead in a National Services Center in 2001, served as a program assistant. Then I became grants management, well, I was a program assistant with um, ONAP, and then I became the grants management specialist. And I think I've been here, I think I can remember seven, well, 19 years as it shows here. And I have a four, uh, 40 years of federal service. I worked with the Indian Health Service for two years. Four years. And my fun facts is I love to cook traditional meals. I love to joke and have fun around my family members and, and, I, um, and friends. And I enjoy participating in watching powwows and dancing. Yes. And what I do, why I do what I do is I love to do what, I'm sorry, I love what I do. My position is so nice. I help the tribal members, you know, becoming homeowners and the homeless and also seeing economic development projects come about, for, um, you know, jobs. And like I said, in the years at OMAP, OMAP was 19 years with SONAP. Total 40 federal service. 
and my specialty is reviewing Indian housing plans, ICBD resource management, and federal compliance. And I enjoy working here in Spelman. We have a great team. We all you know help each other, learn from each other. I enjoy working here. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thanks so much. Great hearing about all the great work that you're doing. And I love that we have so many cooks and adventurous travelers out there and then past tribal employees as well. So welcome on board, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking with us to the end. We really appreciate you. This session was recorded, so there will be a recording available if you would like to go back and reference any of the information that you heard. Um, many thanks to our presenters who put together great presentations for you all. And again, if you have any questions, if you need anything, uh, please do reach out. We are here to assist you and help you be successful. So thank you for your work and all that you all do. We greatly appreciate you. And with that, we will go ahead and sign off. Have a nice summer, everyone. We will see you again in the fall. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.